All right, welcome back, forensic students. We are continuing on with our hair analysis lesson. This is lesson two over this topic, so if you've missed lesson one, make sure that you go back and watch that video or listen to the video before you jump into this lesson. So I want to do a quick recap over what we discussed in lesson one with regards to hair. Now, when we're talking about hair and its applications to forensics, you need to know that hair can be considered class evidence or individual evidence, depending on how it's found at the crime scene. So if the hair is found with the follicle, that's the root, that's the portion of the hair that contains DNA, then we say it is individual evidence because we can narrow down the suspect field to one individual person. However, if we find hair at a crime scene and it contains no follicle and we can't get DNA from it, then we have class evidence. So the only way it's helpful at that point is if we use macroscopic and microscopic properties to sort of help us um, narrow down our suspect field. So let's talk about the follicle. The follicle is the root portion of the hair that contains the nuclear DNA. Okay, so that's the part that we hope to have if we're an investigator and we find a hair sample at the crime scene. But that's not always the case. So um, it's important to understand the, some other characteristics about hair that we may can use to match a suspect sample to a crime scene evidence sample. So the other part of the hair, um, there's two parts to the hair. So we have the follicle and the shaft. The shaft actually consists of three different layers. So we have the cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla. You can see on the image here, the medulla is the very inside core part of the hair. Then we have the cortex, which is the inside portion. That's the part that contains the coloring or the pigment of the hair. And then we have the cuticle, which sort of protects the medulla and the cortex, and it contains the scales sort of a protective layer of the hair. We also talked about macroscopic and microscopic properties. So remember macroscopic properties are properties and characteristics that we can see without the need of a microscope. And then microscopic properties are going to require a microscope to see. So some examples of macroscopic properties with regards to hair would be like color, texture, length, uh, and then microscopic properties would be things like the medulla pattern or the condition of the hair's cuticle or something that we're going to talk about a little later in today's lesson, the medullary index. All right, we also talked about the four different medulla patterns that are possible in a human sample of hair. And today we're going to focus more on the medulla um, and how it can be used to match suspect hair samples to evidence samples. We're also going to talk about some other characteristics and properties of hair. So to get started, you need to know that hairs, human hairs, can vary from region to region on the body, um, even from the same person. So your head hair is not the same as your eyebrow hair, which is not the same as your underarm hair. So we have variations depending on where the hair is derived from. Hairs can also differ, differ between humans and animals. We're going to look at that today and then from human to human. So hairs can originate from the head, the eyebrows or eyelashes, those kind of um, classified together. You can have beard hair, pubic hair, body hair, underarm hair, and each of these hairs have their own characteristics. Again, hairs can vary from one source to another, and you can see that on these graphs. So for example, different ethnic groups are gonna have unique characteristics to that group. Again, you can see it on the graph. So you can see um, the different characteristics that are associated with different ancestral groups like European, uh, European Asian, African groups. Um, and you can see how the hair samples look different under different types of microscopes. You can also see like the difference in the average strand count, the texture, the general texture of the hair. You also need to know that animal hair looks very different than human hair and has some differences there. So they differ in pigmentation, medullary index, which again we'll come back and talk about, uh, and then cuticle top. And you can see in this visual image the differences between human hair and then other animal hairs. 
So specifically, I like this graph because it shows a comparison between human hair and animal hair. So starting with pigment or the color of the hair. So with human hair, the color and pigmentation is constant throughout the hair shaft. Now that is not always the case. So I think about women who dye their hair um, or guys who dye their hair. If you go a long time without doing that, you might have some abrupt color changes like that of animal hair. Um, but for the most part, naturally, the color and pigmentation is pretty constant throughout the hair shaft with some exceptions. Now, the medulla for human hair is relatively thin as compared to animal hair. Animal hair is very wide when we're talking about the medulla. Um, human hair, the medulla makes up a third of the hair shaft. So that number is going to be important uh, in some future things that we're going to talk about and do. Um, so just make sure that you note that. And there will be another slide that has that information on it. Um, animal hair, the medulla is very well defined. Now, scale structure, uh, human hair has overlapping scales, whereas animal hairs can have overlapping scales, but they can also have um, different, let me, I'll go back and it's easier to look at a visual image. So you can have differences in the structure of your different animal hairs. All right, so let's talk about medullary index. This is where we get into some math, which I know you're going to love. Um, but the ratio of the diameter of the medulla to the diameter of the entire hair is known as the medullary index. And so we can actually calculate this number. Um, it's a numerical calculation that can be derived from a hair sample. And so we have a formula, and you'll need to make sure that you write this down. So to get the medullary index, you're going to take the width of the medulla, which on worksheets and samples I will give you, um, and you're going to divide that by the diameter of the hair, and that's going to give you a number, um, and then you're going to use that number to, to make some calculations, some matches, um, and get, gather some information about the hair itself. So this is important to note. If the medullary index is 0.5 or greater, then the hair most likely is from an animal hair. Okay, so if the medullary in index is 0.5 or greater, the hair probably came from an animal. If the medullary index is 0.33 or less, then the hair is most likely from a human, came from a human hair. Um, and so we're going to use that. That's just some extra information that you may need. Now, I always get the question, what if the medullary index is between 0.33 and 0.5? Well, in that case, you can't really tail. Um, so you can just use your best judgment on that. All right, let's work one out together um, using this formula. So make sure you have um, the formula written down, width of the medulla divided by diameter of the hair. All right, so suppose this sample of hair has a diameter of 110 microns and has a medulla that measures 58 microns. If you're going to calculate the medullary index of the hair, you're going to have to remember divide the width of the medulla by the diameter of the hair sample. So 58 divided by 110, if you um, calculate that, you would get 0.53. Now, if I'm comparing this hair sample to maybe a suspect hair sample, that might be important. The medullary index might be important in making that comparison. It certainly wouldn't hurt to have the, that information. Um, if I was trying to distinguish between a, a human hair and an animal hair, um, I can use the information that I had on a couple screens. That okay, here it is. So if the medullary index is greater than 0.5, then we have animal hair. So I'm going to go back. We have um, a medullary index greater than 0.5, so more than likely this specific hair is from an animal. All right, so let's talk about hair itself. Hair is incredibly strong. The reason for that is the protein that makes up hair, which we call keratin. If you'll remember from biology, keratin is a chain of amino acids that forms um, a helix or a spiral. And when it is connected with the amino acids, it creates a really strong bond. So because of this bond, hair is resistant to decomposition. And this can be 
extremely use, useful for forensic investigators because they can still collect hair from um, the deceased even if they have been um, deceased for a long period of time. So forensic lab analysts can use different methods for analyzing hair. We mentioned this, how they collect hair in a previous lesson, but remember hair is collected by plucking, shaking, scraping different surfaces. Investigators can also use adhesives to collect hairs from victims or other objects. Um, and then the hair can be analyzed using um, using a microscope. We can get those microscopic properties. And then sometimes chemical testing um, can be used to analyze hair. So uh, the best microscope to use is an electron microscope because it can create very detailed images. So an electron microscope can magnify a hair sample up to 50,000 times its original size, just super enlarged and can really provide some, some great characteristics and properties of hair. Um, if you have some time and you want to research the Casey Anthony case, um, you can just search on YouTube, Casey Anthony hair, um, and you can go back and watch um, in that case, the court proceedings were recorded and you can watch the hair experts or the hair analyst um, who worked on that case. And um, it's very interesting to listen to their take on the evidence that was found in that case. All right, so anything that we ingest or absorb through our skin can then become part of our hair, which is super important in forensics because, um, because hair doesn't readily decompose. That means that investigators can test hair samples to establish a timeline of a suspect or a victim's exposure to different toxins and drugs. Um, a great example of this is the case of Napoleon Bonaparte, which if you're one of my students, we're going to do further research on. If you're not one of my students, um, I would highly recommend after this video, just doing a little bit of research on Napoleon Bonaparte and um, sort of the debate behind his death. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there, um, but it's very interesting how uh, hair and something called neutron activation analysis was used to solve uh, the mysterious death of this political leader. So I just mentioned neutron activation analysis and you might have thought, what in the world is she talking about? So neutron activation analysis is a test um, basically, it is a chemical test that exposes hair to a beam of neutrons in a nuclear reactor. And the purpose of this is to determine the existence and quantities of different trace elements in a hair sample. So this test can actually provide links between hair evidence and the circumstances that may have surrounded um, the person's death or the hair itself. Um, neutron activation analysis was the nuclear test that was performed on Napoleon Bonaparte's hair. Um, and helped sort of determine his death. So it was believed that he died of stomach cancer, although for years there was a lot of speculation that he was poisoned. Um, and then in 1960, the neutron activation analysis test um, sort of authenticated the hairs that were collected after Napoleon's death contained trace amounts of arsenic. So they believe that he was poisoned via arsenic. All right, so that ends our hair lesson, um, and I will see you in the next lesson.